what's poppin everybody welcome back to the channel it's kb and we locked in now let's jump into it today we're gonna be talking about 42 doug the history behind 42 doug the place he came from and why he might be looking at over five years in prison plus we're gonna take an intricate look at how the detroit streets work how 42 doug is tied to it all and how it's all led to where he's currently at today so without further ado, let's jump into it. Detroit, the Motor City. This is home to 42 Doug. And just like with most rappers, in order to understand how they got to where they're at, you gotta understand where they came from. Doug grew up in the 90s. And like I said, he was being raised in Michigan, which is notorious for his savageness. Doug grew up in the six mile of Detroit on the east side. Detroit is like many other major metropolitan areas, except there is one huge difference. Detroit has been an economic ruin for over 70 years, which has caused a dramatic increase in poverty and crime. In fact, in 2013, Detroit was forced to go without a mayor after the city declared bankruptcy due to its declining economy. It's so bad that a lot of people in the area still don't have clean water to this day. Detroit has a lot of gang infested areas, for example, the 7th Mile, which is notoriously controlled by Bloods. Speaking of the 7th Mile Bloods, there is another rapper that will play a role in this story later in the video named Sada Baby, and Sada Baby is heavily affiliated with the 7 Mile Bloods. Anyway, more on that later. Like I said, Detroit is heavily infested with gangs, and according to the stats, 1 in 28 people in Detroit City are gang members. As expected from a city with an abundance of gang culture, the violent crime rate is also sky high. In 2022, Detroit is the second most dangerous city in America. It hasn't always been this way, and there is a clear path of decline that can be attributed to the city's degradation. Back in the day, companies like General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, they were producing their vehicles in the city, but eventually they got outpriced and outpaced by foreign competitors in places like Asia. So in an effort to compete, these companies began outsourcing their work to cheaper places like Asia and Mexico. And as a result, people in the Detroit area started losing their jobs. With that, the city became poorer and wealthier people began to move out of the city as well. A mass exodus of sorts was taking place and real estate demand slowed as people stopped buying real estate. No new businesses wanted to come into the city because everyone was leaving and no one wanted to live there. The only people that were left were the people that were too poor to escape. A bad situation already, but it was made worse by the fact that Detroit is absolutely enormous. You can fit Boston, San Francisco, and Manhattan inside the Detroit city limits. This means the people that were left were spread out into different pockets of the city. The local government was stuck with the arduous task of trying to maintain the city's infrastructure to serve the entire city while only receiving taxes from the leftover population, which wasn't sustainable. The police became severely underfunded and the city went to hell with crime. To sum it up, Detroit has no core industry anymore. The wealthy people are long gone, vacant properties don't generate taxes, and all the things that makes the city nice cost money, which Detroit has none. In 2020, Detroit reported 42,435 total crimes, which sounds like a f ton, but it was a 14.4% decrease from the previous year. And then in 2021, it ramped back up. In 2022, ain't looking no better for Detroit. But out of dirt comes flowers, and the city has produced some very talented hip-hop acts. People like Eminem, Big Sean, also more gritty artists like T Grizzly, Sada Baby, and today's video topic, 42 Doug. Forty Two Doug was born November 25th, 1995, and was raised on the east side of Detroit. He says he fell in love with music while skating at the local skate park, Oriel Skateland. Now, a lot isn't known about Doug's early life, and believe me, I try my hardest to get y'all some details, but every time this dude's asked about his life, he expertly dodges the question. But what we do know is he jumped off the porch in his early teens. According to his official biography, that was distributed to Deezer, Doug was noted as being homeless at only 15 years old. This came after Doug was arrested for the first time at only 14 years old. 
Now, a lot of bloggers have reported that Doug's first arrest took place at 15 years old, but the truth is they've just been mistaken. He was arrested at 15 years old, but his first arrest took place at 14 years old. According to reports, he was arrested for possession of a firearm and was put on probation. Since he was just a juvenile and it was his first charge, the court felt like that was enough punishment. After catching that charge and becoming homeless, you would think Doug had already had enough of the street life. But only one year after getting off with some probation and only a month short of his 16th birthday, while being homeless at 15 years old, Doug was arrested again. This time, they got him on carjacking charges, but that wasn't all. When they arrested him this time, he was found to be in possession of another firearm. This was his second arrest and technically his second and third charge, he just happened to be catching them at the exact same time. So when the prosecutors charged him, they charged him as an adult. When Doug went to court, the judge sentenced him to four years in prison. While he was locked up though, he ended up getting into a fist fight with another inmate and his sentence was extended by two years, making his total sentence now six years. Now, I know this seems very unfortunate, but it was this incident and sentence that would put 42 Doug on track to becoming a chart-topping rapper. Because of the fight, he was placed in solitary confinement for 30 days. He explained this situation in an interview with GQ saying, I would be in solitary confinement for 30 days at a time and only eating breakfast. I used to get out of solitary confinement being 110 pounds because I didn't like any of the food. I would have days where I would only eat one cookie a day. Bro was only eating a cookie a day? Now that's the bottom if there ever was one for real. Like I said though, this moment in Doug's life would turn out to be a crucial one, as this is where he learned to rap. While in solitary confinement, he was locked down for 23 hours a day with only one hour of rec time. It was during one of these one hour freedom walks that one of the other inmates, who also just so happened to be Doug's brother, would start teaching him and encouraging him to rap. Doug said he was trash the first time he tried to rap in solitary confinement and really didn't put much effort into it, but during another stay, the second time he was in the hole, he decided he would actually dedicate himself to developing the craft. He would spend his time teaching himself the ins and outs of rap one bar at a time, one day at a time, and by the time he was finally released from prison in 2017, he was an expert at crafting his bars. How did you get into the rap game? I mean, a couple of my they rap. So I already was like listening and shit. As far as me rapping, I started rapping in jail. How long were you in jail for? Six years. During that six years, when did rapping start? Fifth year. Like, well, really like the fourth year because I was supposed to get out in four years. So really the fourth year when I was about to get out. Who taught you? How did you learn? Man, ain't nobody teaching me. I taught myself. Like with most rappers, Doug grew up listening to rap and had a few people that he says heavily influenced him. Doug told Billboard in an interview, I used to listen to Young Jeezy and Yo Gotti all day. I got into Gotti, but I was on Jeezy from the get go. We was listening to Jeezy and everybody wanted to be trapping and sh we was really just having fun and everyone wanted to go skate and be kids. He also said, I f with Big Sean as soon as he dropped too. Big Sean being another rapper from Detroit. These are the rappers that influenced Doug, and it wouldn't be long before he found himself linked up with one of those rappers, getting the big break he had been dreaming of. Shortly after his release from prison, Doug, who was now looking at rap as a serious career opportunity, didn't waste any time trying to make it a reality. In 2017, some of his homies named 42 Twins was at the studio and asked Doug to roll through. Doug recorded a barrage of songs in this session, all of which featured 42 Twins with songs like Shine Regardless, Had To, and We Gon' Get It, being some of the first songs Doug released that he put out between 2017 and October of 2017. After that, on November 28, 2017, Doug would quickly release his first official single, Living, which currently sits at almost 5 million views on YouTube, which not a bad single if you ask me. What? Was that, that ain't the first solo song I did, though. Was it? It was the first solo song I recorded. Living was the first one I put out. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Living. Living. 
but Doug kept dropping. On January 25th, 2018, Doug released his second solo single, Mama, I'm Sorry, which is a heartfelt apology to his mom for going to prison for six years when he was younger. Now, this song currently only sits at around 500,000 views on YouTube and didn't really perform that well for Doug for whatever reason, but if you haven't heard it, go check it out as I think it's one of Doug's best songs. Doug followed these releases up with his very first mixtape titled 11241 Waver, released on July 19th, 2018 which has since been removed from almost all platforms although if you look hard enough it still exists on youtube with various re-uploads floating around he followed that up with a second installment of his mixtape titled 11241 Wayburn Part 2, which was basically an extended or deluxe version of the first part, only having a few extra songs added to it. These singles would carry Doug until his next release, which was a collab he recorded with another Detroit rapper named Babyface Ray called The Streets. This song helped put some bread in Doug's pocket, and once he got the bread, he did what any street rapper would do and started betting it all away in dice games on the block, but again, it seems like the worst decisions Doug makes always leads to the biggest W. 4-2 Doug was in LA with another Detroit rapper named T Grizzly, chilling and having a good time. T Grizzly was linked with 4-2 Doug through his homies 4-2 Twins, who had recorded a song titled Secrecy with T Grizzly way back in 2017. T Grizzly, he'll play a bigger part in this story later, along with Sada Baby, who I mentioned earlier, but let's keep moving forward with the come up story for now. Back in LA, Doug was kicking it with T, and as I said, Doug liked to play dice. And while he was kicking it with T, another massively popular rapper rapper named Lil Baby showed up and found himself going head to head against Doug in a dice game. Shit, we uh, my father just used to gamble. Him and T used to gamble. And one day T brought me over there with them. And we was gambling and shit. We built off that, you know what I was saying? Eventually we stopped gambling. We don't even gamble each other. Lil Baby had recently signed with Quality Control Music, or QC, and in 2018, Lil Baby was absolutely dominating the Billboard charts. Plus, he had received a Drake stimulus package recently, having Drake featured on a song titled Yes Indeed that sent Lil Baby's career into the stratosphere. Lil Baby was asked about what made Doug stand out to him in an interview, and he said, I ain't never seen no other youngin that gambled and liked gambling as much as I did. Doug says he didn't even tell Lil Baby he was a rapper at first. He was just kicking it to kick it, and that's how him and Baby became certified besties. But back in Atlanta, Baby was listening to some music and turning up with one of his homies. And one of Doug's songs came in rotation. The Baby was listening to it and was like, who's this rapping? The people with him told him it was Doug. So he called Doug up while listening to the song and let it be known he was rocking with the tracks and told him he had to come out to Atlanta to work on some music. Doug flew out to Atlanta in early 2018, and once there, he would head to the studio where Baby was at, along with a bunch of other members of Lil Baby's 4PF crew, 4PF standing for Four Pockets Full. It was in this session that Doug and Baby would record some of the biggest hits of their careers, they just ain't know it at the time. Doug said in an interview with Billboard, we was just at the studio freestyling and the whole 4PF was at the studio. Me and Baby would throw on some beats and we'll just start talking to each other. In this session, they recorded songs like We Paid and Grace. But remember, this was all the way back in 2018. Now you might be thinking, wait, those songs didn't release until 2020 and you would be right. There are some delays with the release of these singles. Let me explain. Apparently, because all they did was freestyle in the studio, none of the songs had hooks on them, which means Lil Baby's label didn't want to release them. So these tracks lay dormant for a while, but that didn't slow down Doug's motion. In fact, because of his performances while in the studio with Lil Baby, Baby said he knew Doug was destined to blow up and was all in on making Doug take off musically. Baby wanted to provide Doug with the best opportunity he could and even though Baby probably had the money to do it, he initially opted not to sign him to 4PF and instead started shopping him around to different labels that he thought could accommodate Doug better than 4PF. Eventually, Doug's music landed on the desk of Yo Gotti, a Memphis rapper and label boss who runs CMG also known as Collective Music Group. Tell me about this, um, this Yo Gotti link up. I met Gotti, well, really, baby, had put Gotti on my music, you know what I'm saying? So, I love, and the rest is history, huh? No, really, he played my music, but he ain't telling who I was. He, Gotti, act like, I asked, like, well, who is this? He like, this is my homeboy from Detroit. <laughs> he like, this is my homeboy from Detroit, he hard, you know what I'm saying? But he said he was gonna turn me on to Gotti, like, I want you to, uh, 
sign my homie, you know what Right. I mean? But Gotti, he came to Detroit, he asked me, like, you want to come out to the, uh, he did the big show, he like, you want to come out? I'm like, yeah. He brought me out, you know what I'm saying? Then, next day we met, he like, what is it going to take? You know what I'm saying? Put it together. I'm like, he got to just, like, from that point on, he was just making calls for me, getting my music on work, like, just doing it for me, you know what I'm saying? He feel good, you know, because really, I'm, I'm as regular as it get. Anyway, Gotti heard Doug's music and knew instantly that he wanted to sign Doug. But after shopping Doug around and seeing the response he received, Lil Baby wanted to sign Doug too. But he was trying to sign me at the same time. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, so he like, I don't just want to just give you to him. Mm-hmm. In the end, Yo Gotti and Lil Baby ended up creating a joint venture between 4PF and CMG in conjunction with Interscope Records, which allowed Doug to sign to both of them. This would be solidified on March 9, 2019 at the Detroit leg of Meek Mill's The Motivation Tour. Yo Gotti was set to do a show with Meek Mill, and they both brought out 42 Doug on the stage. Once on the stage, Yo Gotti presented 42 Doug with a nice style CMG chain and announced that Doug had signed. Once the ink dried on the contract, 42 Doug went to work, and only six days after getting his chain at that concert, Doug dropped his third mixtape but first release, Young and Turnt, which included songs like Dog Food, The Streets featuring Babyface Ray, You The One featuring Yo Gotti, and Trippin'. These songs have gone on to rack up millions of streams, but it wouldn't be until 2020 when Doug really hit a new height. He released his second mixtape since becoming a signed rapper titled Young and Turnt on March 27, 2020, after the release of a song titled Grace featuring Lil Baby, which currently sits at 145 million views on YouTube, and Doug was seeing a moderate amount of success with the mixtape. But then, on May 6, 2020, Lil Baby released a song titled We Paid that would take things to a whole new level. Grace and We Paid were some of the songs that they recorded in that first studio session where they were just freestyling and most of them didn't have hooks. But apparently after signing with Lil Baby, the two went back and finished a bunch of songs they had in the vault. When We Paid dropped, it absolutely blew up, peaking at number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, marking the first time Doug entered the Billboard Top 10 list ever. The release and success of this song also boosted his Young and Turnt 2 album into the charts as well, where it peaked at number 58 on the Billboard Top 200. Today, We Pay currently sits at around 330 million views on YouTube alone. From here, Doug would only continue to go up, securing features from artists such as Marshmello, Lil' Key, Meek Mill, Black Youngster, Big Sean, T.I., Tory Lanez, and Roddy Rich. Doug was on fire at this point in his career, and on May 21st, 2021, he dropped his third album, Freedom Boys, which charted at number eight on the Billboard. This project had a bunch of singles on it, most of them titled after homies that Doug knew that was locked up. Doug's last official release came on April 8th, 2022, and was a collab tape with DSTG titled Last Ones Left that peaked at number 8 on the Billboard top charts. Also, marking the highest spot a project of Doug's had ever been in the Billboard top chart. Now, Doug was enjoying the fruits of his labor, getting money, rocking shows, and living the superstar lifestyle. He had plenty of funny, weird, and viral moments to help build the buzz around his name. He even hit a point where he had to ask fans to stop randomly pulling up on him because it was unsafe for him. Then, in this clip, he talks about how surprising it was when fans started wanting to take pictures. Pictures should be surprising. People be like, let me get a picture. To me, I'm still me. So, uh, you know, I don't really know who I am in other people's eyes. I don't pretty much say no that much. That's just a surreal moment for me. But he also had some downright weird moments, like this one, that caused outrage on the internet because of, well, watch the video. Mm -hmm. 
Then there was this clip where he went viral over some questionable lyrics. Here, I'll play it and you can decide what you think 42 Doug says on this song. Supposed to keep us late. I was our second date. I was trying to pay the rent. Clearly, Doug was having the time of his life, but like with most of these stories, everything that glitters ain't gold. And while Doug was making a meteoric rise in the music industry, he still had one foot in the streets and it wouldn't take long for it all to start catching up with him. Now, in order to continue, I need to give you guys a little more backstory on Doug because while he was making a certified come up, he was also still entertaining the streets. And in order to understand how Doug was involved in the streets on a pretty heavy level, you gotta understand how it all started. I think at this point of the story, it's time for us to start linking Doug's story to a bigger picture because there is some history here that needs to be explained that'll help you guys understand Doug, his music, and the decisions he's made throughout his life. Now that we've become aware of Doug's story, it's time to touch on his ties to the streets. We're going to start with his name, 4-2 Doug. The 4-2 at the beginning of his name is a numerical reference to a crip set called the Hustle Boys or the 4-2 Hustle Boys. The 4-2 Hustle Boys is classified as a Detroit street gang that has a history of prescription narcotic distribution, witness tampering, murder, and more. Plus, they've had a long running feud with another Detroit gang called SMB or the Seven Mile Bloods. Local law enforcement have named several different gangs in the city, but the ones that we're going to focus on here are the members from Force specific area. Members from the Red Zone, Six Mile Cheddar Grove, Max Out 220, and the 4-2 Hustle Boys. Now the gang that Doug is affiliated with, the 4-2 Hustle Boys, was allegedly started all the way back in late 2004 or early 2005 and originally was formed to promote and organize parties at area nightclubs so they were working like promoters. But the gang used these parties and nightclubs as a tool to distribute narcotics to partygoers and eventually they expanded beyond the parties and clubs. In fact, the gang operated an entire drug pipeline that stretched from Detroit to Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Because of the way the Hustle Boys were moving in the streets, they did end up developing rivalries with other gangs in the city, and this included the Seven Mile Blood. As a result of these rivalries, members and affiliates of the Hustle Boys were the targets of and were the perpetrators of acts of violence that included shootings involving the rivals that they had developed. Now, according to police records, in 2007, a man named Mark Antoine Davis, an original member of the Hustle Boys, started trafficking Oxycontin pills. He would obtain the pills in Michigan and then transport the drugs to other states. And this is the pipeline that included Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. The gang used apartments and homes in Ohio and West Virginia as way stations along the drug pipeline. And they allegedly used fast food parking lots as storefronts to help peddle the drugs as well. In 2009 and 2010, the gang used women to haul the drugs, according to an indictment. The pills were packaged inside condoms and then stashed in the woman's third pocket. That's what we'll call it, if you get what I'm saying. The gang eventually branched out by selling marijuana and firearms stolen during home invasions and burglaries that took place in the city. The Hustle Boys also relied on other gangs, including Boss Hog and Gutter Boys, to provide security and customers in neighborhoods that the Hustle Boys were serving. All of this information was released when the federal government unsealed an indictment and arrested 10 Hustle Boy members in 2011. We've been running the streets of Detroit for the past four years or so, but this morning a violent Detroit gang has been dealt a major blow. Yeah, they're known as the Hustle Boys, and in just a few hours they'll go before a judge. 7 Action News reporter Kim Russell is live this morning with more on this. Now, Kim, this is a dangerous group. That's what the FBI says a four-year investigation involving state, county, and Detroit police revealed. The FBI also says that this gang was based out of a Detroit home at Seven Mile and Hoover that the Hustle Boys formed six or seven years ago. And when they started, they were promoting events at nightclubs, but they eventually started dealing drugs like Oxycontin and marijuana. Here's a look at some mug shots released of some of them after a grand jury indicted 10 of them. Of the 10 accused gang members, eight are in custody and face a judge in federal court today. The other two are expected to turn themselves in. They're all charged with conspiracy and dealing drugs. This was an organization that did not uh, limit their criminal 
uh, dealings to the Detroit area. Uh, they often traveled out of state to sell drugs illegally, and uh, they also engaged in uh, acts of violence with other rival street gangs here in Detroit, uh, and they were involved in uh, shootings. The FBI says while taking these suspected gang members off the streets, they also took thousands of dollars in weapons and drugs off the streets, making us all safer. This is why Doug dropped a whole mixtape titled Freedom Boys, where he would name several tracks after his homies he had locked up. Regardless, this enterprise that the 4-2 Hustle Boys was building was causing some tension in the streets of Detroit, mainly with one other gang, the Seven Mile Bloods, or SMB. And there is over 1,000 pages of court documents and evidence that spanned over a 10-year investigation detailing how all of this was interconnected. Now, obviously, I'm not going to read all 1,000 pages of transcripts to y'all, but I went through the documents and I'm going to give you a brief rundown of how it's all tied together and how it'll play a bigger role here in a little a while and connect back to 42 Doug. The Seven Mile Bloods, similar to the Hustle Boys, formed in Detroit in the early 2000s, around 2003, and since then, prosecutors said gang members have targeted and marked for death dozens of rivals and even had an Instagram hit list. SMB participated in more than 14 shootings, at least four homicides, 11 attempted murders, and drug crimes that eroded the quality of life in Detroit for the citizens. SMB is from what locals refer to as the Red Zone, in the northeast corner of the 48205 zip code between Seven Mile and Eight Mile Roads, east of Gradiot and west of Kelly. This zip code is so dangerous that some locals call it the 4280 die. This animated map shows the location of all the homicides in the 48205 zip code since 2009. The red zone is part pharmacy, part killing field, and part music studio where gang members peddled drugs, fought rivals, and shot rap videos on street corners. Gang members made money from selling crack cocaine, heroin, marijuana, oxycontin pain pills, and prescription cough syrup, the main ingredient mixed with Sprite to make the potent drink lean. According to these here court documents, prosecutors say the racketeering enterprise generated unexplained wealth that Seven Mile Blood members spent on cars, $50,000 diamond encrusted Breitling watches, $600 belts, and a Detroit strip club. There is no evidence that any of these individuals had a job, Assistant U.S. Attorney said when she was asked about them. The Seven Mile Bloods turned several abandoned homes or trap houses into drug stores within the red zone where narcotics were stashed before being sold to customers across metro detroit and beyond between 2003 and 2011 investigators found seven mile blood gang members drugs money and drug paraphernalia at almost one dozen homes on just one block alone in the red zone the gang's reach extended far beyond detroit in charleston the gang concentrated on selling one drug oxycontin a powerful and addictive pain medication and the same pill the Hustle Boys was serving up as well. In 2009, members started buying extra pills from the Red Zone residents who had prescriptions, and the gang paid $15 a pill, according to prosecutors in Detroit, and sold the drug for $60 a pill in Charleston. The money really started flowing in. Prosecutors said the drug ring was generating more than $80,000 a week. To haul drugs from West Virginia, the gang used Greyhound buses, rental cars, and stuffers, which are just females that the gang was paying a thousand dollars a trip to hide the pills in their third pocket now eventually the gang members were transporting thousands of these pills each trip and had to lay off the stuffers Derek kennedy an admitted member of the racketeering conspiracy in the seven mile blood said when it's that much you just gotta try to hide it and just do the speed limit and hope you don't get pulled over the biggest threat to these gang members, however, would follow after a chance encounter at a Detroit parole office in July of 2014. On July 14, 2014, 23-year-old twins Michael and Martez Davis, the 42 twins, arrived at the Lawton Parole Office for a morning meeting with their parole agent. The twins not only are identical in physical stature, but also have identical convictions for armed robbery, hence why they were on parole. These are the same guys I mentioned earlier that invited Doug to his first studio session, and one of the 42 twins is actually featured on Doug's like first five songs that he ever released. And the twins are also part of the 42 Hustle Boys, which is self-explanatory given that their name has 42 in it. Anyway, back at the parole office, 
At around 11 a.m., the twins were finished with their parole meetings, and before they left, they crossed paths with a rival and accused Seven Miles Blood leader named Billy Arnold, known in the streets of Detroit as Barenzo, D-Man, and Killer, depending on who you ask. By coincidence, Arnold had his own meeting with the parole agent that morning. After spotting the twins, Arnold called several friends, including an alleged Seven Mile Blood gang member Corey Bailey, aka Cocaine Sonny, so the group could confront the hustle boy. The Davis twins, meanwhile, climbed into a car filled with two other members of the Hustle Boys, including DeWine Neff Page. The Hustle Boys traveled for about four miles before approaching the intersection of Grand River Avenue and Oatman Boulevard on Detroit's west side. The Hustle Boys were shadowed by three cars filled with Seven Mile Blood gang members. Near Grand River and Oatman, a white Chrysler Sebring filled with SMB members accelerated and pulled alongside the Hustle Boys car. Barenzo and Sonny leaned out of the Sebring and opened fire. One of the 4-2 twins was shot in the chest. During the shootout, more bullets came through the car and struck Neff in the left eye and upper body. Neff was still alive, but just barely. He lingered in a coma for several weeks before dying at the age of 22 years old. After Neff was killed, Barenzo, the SMB member that the twins seen at the parole office, talked about the shooting with another man named Derek Kennedy. Kennedy pleaded guilty to a racketeering conspiracy and testified about the conversation saying, Barenzo said he cooked him, he shot him. Martez Davis, the other 42 twin, survived the shooting as well and was charged in a separate federal gun case in August of that year. At the time, Assistant U.S. Attorney Rajesh Prasad said Davis was a suspect in the drive-by shooting deaths of two rappers, Raymond 47 Mel Campbell and Dominique Brown in July 2017. This shootout at the parole office was one of the starting factors for a brutal and deadly beef that claimed the lives of multiple people. Okay, so after the shooting at the parole office, Barenzo and Sonny were arrested for the murder. The prosecutors even had a star witness in the case named Michael Davis, one of the 4-2 twins, the one who survived the attack after being shot in the chest. Davis testified twice, in secret, in front of a grand jury. You will hear that it's Michael Davis, one of the twins who identified Billy Arnold or Barenzo and Corey Bailey or Cocaine Sonny as the people who shot up that car, Assistant U.S. Attorney Christopher Graveline told jurors before the trial. This defendant, Mr. Davis, has had an ongoing rap dispute with other members because they happen to side themselves with people who are affiliated with the Seven Mile Bloods. Uh, and one of the exhibits that I provided to the court was exhibit number nine, which is an exhibit that de that is a exchange of com communications between this defendant, 42 twins, and a gentleman that goes by the name of 47 Entertainment. 47 Entertainment was an individual by the name of Mel. Mel was killed last week uh, in a uh, in a drive-by shooting on I-94 in the area of I-94 in Illinois. Uh, Mel was in a vehicle with a female. That vehicle was riddled with 52 gunshots from an AK style weapon. The promise that Michael Davis, one of the 4-2 twins, would sit on the witness stand and identify SMB members in a fatal shooting was broken quickly on March 8th. Davis, who was 27 at the time, defied U.S. District Judge George Steeves order to testify about the shooting. When he got on the stand, all he said was, no, your honor. Davis stepped down from the witness stand and was indicted for refusing to testify about who shot him and killed his buddy Neff. Neff's killing in July 2014 forged a new alliance on the east side of Detroit. The Hustle Boys, Six Mile Cheddar Grove, Max Out 220, and a few smaller gangs banded together to battle the historically stronger Seven Mile Blood. After Neff died, photos of 10 Seven Mile Blood members were posted on Instagram. Prosecutors claim it was a hit list. Donnell Hendricks, who raps under the name Hard Work Jig, survived being shot in August 2014 at Eastland Center Mall. Jason Whiteboy Gill, a 30-year-old Seven Mile Blood gang member, was killed the following February. Somebody pumped 18 bullets into accused Seven Mile Blood member Michael Rogers in 2015. In all, seven accused members of the Seven Mile Bloods were shot. Four died. 
The Seven Mile Bloods retaliated by posting photos of 62 rivals on the gang's Instagram page, OOO Big Blood. On May 1, 2015, alleged Seven Mile Blood leader Devin Block McClure was riding in a blue Ford Crown Vic on Detroit's east side, south of the red zone. At around 1.15, Block's car neared the intersection of Hayes and Houston Witter. That's when a tan-colored SUV pulled alongside Block. Someone hung out the SUV and started shooting. Shooting. Bullets shattered windows in Block's car, flattened the tires, and struck the Seven Mile Blood leader several times in the head, killing him on the spot. After Block was killed, his photo was posted on his rival's Instagram account, All New Victims 55, with the caption that said, We got Block out the way, B Man or Barenzo, you know you next. Block's death still remains unsolved till this day. The Seven Mile Bloods only waited six hours for vengeance, though. That Friday, a man named Raphael Carter was walking home from a neighborhood party store near Denby High School with his daughters, ages two and three. A white Dodge Avenger pulled alongside the trio. Witnesses and evidence indicate Barenzo and his homie Keithion Porter, nicknamed KP, were riding in the white Dodge Avenger. A single gunman leaned out the front passenger seat window and fired multiple rounds from an AR-15 style rifle. The first shot struck Carter and severed his spine, instantly paralyzing him. Carter was shot again and again and again and again and again. A total of 22 shots were fired, but miraculously, Carter survived and so did both of his daughters, one of whom hid behind a barbecue grill during the incident. Soon after the shooting, someone posted an excerpt from the Detroit news coverage of the shooting on the Seven Mile Bloods Instagram page, OOO Big Blood. After the failed but life-changing hit on Carter, the Seven Mile Bloods continued to wreak havoc. Another Hustler Boy affiliate named Devontae Little Roberts was shot in a drive-by when multiple SMB members hung out the window of a Chrysler 300 after pulling up next to a Pontiac G6 that Devontae was sitting in and opened fire, hitting Devontae in the head. Apparently, it happened at such close range, Devontae even had gunpowder and suit from the blast on his head when it was over. After the shooting, the official SMB Instagram account posted a picture of Devontae with a caption that said he thought he was happy with three laughing face emojis, and it ended with got him. Apparently, the weapon used in this incident was the same AR-style weapon used on Carter that paralyzed him. Then, two days later, they caught another op lacking at a red light at the intersection of State Fair and Hoover, west of the red zone. Two gunmen, one of whom was Barenzo, approached a black Chevy Impala idling at the intersection. A last hustle boy member, Darnell Kennedy, whose photo appeared on the Instagram hit list posted by the Seven Mile Bloods, was driving the Impala. They opened fire and let off over 64 shots, 36 of which came from the same AR-style rifle that was used in the previous two incidents. Now, they let off all them shots, but they missed, and Darnell Kennedy would survive the attack. But a month later, Kennedy was at the Roosevelt Banquet Center celebrating the birth of his baby, and according to court records, Barenzo shot up the baby shower. This time, the bullets didn't miss Kennedy, and he was hit in the leg while another bystander was struck as well. Three months after the baby shower shooting in September of 2015, federal agents made a breakthrough in the Seven Mile Bloods investigation at the Crazy Horse Strip Club on Detroit's southwest side. The gang was at the club for a party honoring their slain leader, Devin Block McClure, who had been killed previously. The day was dubbed Block Day and the party was promoted on Instagram. Members of the FBI Violent Gang Task Force spotted the post and hatched an operation. As the strip club party stretched into the early morning, task force investigators conducted surveillance around a crazy horse, and prosecutors say several gang members and associates were spotted arriving at the club, including Barenzo. Investigators were watching when Barenzo and his friend left the club in a 2002 Chevy Trailblazer with an Ohio license plate. According to the court records, the Trailblazer was stolen, so investigators tried to stop the vehicle. A chase with speeds topping 115 miles an hour along the eastbound Interstate 94 ended in a wreck on the ramp to southbound Interstate 75. Investigators found Barenzo in the front passenger seat of the Trailblazer and a long sought after piece of evidence. 
a loaded AR-15. Prosecutors say ballistic tests matched the weapon to all three shootings. Right before uh, the trailblazer tries, attempts to make the turn onto I-75, it almost crashes into a van and another panel truck. At that time, you can see uh, the trailblazer attempt to make the ramp onto I-75. Because of its speed, it could not, and it went up onto the embankment, at which time its two front tires, uh, they erupted at that point. The police were not that far behind. They pulled up almost immediately onto the, ve uh, onto the vehicle. And uh, on the video, you see Mr. Arthur running away from the driver's side door. This beef ultimately ended with 21 Seven Mile Blood gang members catching a brutal indictment that seen at least five of the members facing the death penalty. Now, 42 Doug himself was not implicated in these crimes at the time, and that's not what I'm trying to push here, but one thing is for certain. These are his boys that were getting hit and they were shooting back. The people he grew up with, and no doubt, this had an impact on the way he maneuvered in the streets. And while Doug wasn't implicated in these crimes, that doesn't mean he wouldn't have legal trouble of his own. Now you would think that after being arrested at 14 for a firearm, being arrested at 15 for carjacking, and then being sentenced to four years only to get it extended to six years, and being released when you're 22 after missing all of your teenage years, and after all the gang history that surrounds you, you would think that Doug wouldn't want any more trouble around him. And for most people, that would be the case. This is more so true if you happen to become a superstar rapper with a ton of money after the fact. But for Doug, it was always one foot in the game and one foot in the streets. After being released from prison at 22, Doug was a convicted felon. One of the things that happens when you're convicted of a crime is that you lose your right to possess a firearm. Well, in March of 2020, law enforcement received a tip from an anonymous source that said Doug had been to Stoddard's range and guns in Atlanta, holding and firing a 9mm Glock. To make it worse, they even had video footage of Doug doing it. As a result, Doug was arrested, but his attorney did a phenomenal job in the courtroom and Doug was only sentenced to three years probation for the charge plus a $90,000 fine. So it looked like he was gonna get out and enjoy his freedom after all, but he couldn't stay out of trouble. And while he was on probation, Doug would fail multiple drug tests for opioids and weed, which of course is a violation of the probation agreement he had, which I'll touch on here in just a few minutes. But failing these drug tests weren't the only problems Doug was facing. He was arrested again on Monday, August 3rd, 2020, after allegedly evading police in Oakland County, Michigan, a suburb outside of Detroit. Oakland County's Chief Assistant Prosecutor Paul Walton said that the police attempted to pull over a 2020 Chevy Tahoe on June 5, 2020, and although the SUV was initially pulled over, the driver, who was unidentified at the time, later fled the scene when the officer approached the vehicle. The police later ran the SUV's license plate and discovered it was a rental from Hertz and was under the name of a local promoter who said that Doug was a client of his that he had let borrow the vehicle. The detective reviewed the surveillance footage from the day of the incident and found that the 25-year-old rapper was actually the person driving the vehicle. In addition to that, the responding police officer claimed that Doug assaulted him in his attempt to flee. It took two months, but Doug was eventually arrested and booked at the Oakland County Jail for fleeing a police officer, which is a third-degree felony. The rapper posted a $20,000 bond and was released from custody on Tuesday, August 4, 2020. However, as a condition of his release, Doug was ordered to wear an ankle monitor. Then, in March of 2022, Doug would have to face some of the most serious allegations made against him when he was accused of violently assaulting a woman and her friend while at a hotel in Miami. According to her, the rapper violently attacked her friend while holding her hostage inside of a hotel room. The details of what occurred came in fractured posts that included photos of an alleged police report and the entrance to Leo's Miami Hotel. While what exactly took place is unclear, this is what the accuser offered in written text over the images. To begin, the person alleged that they or a friend was offered $50,000 in hush money to not speak about what allegedly occurred. Pictures of an injured woman were also included, as well as allegations that another woman set them up on top of that. However, nothing's ever came of this, or at least nothing yet, and Doug has stayed relatively silent on the matter. Either way, it's officially part of the 42 Doug story now, so you know. These are the allegations and problems Doug has faced in his career, and like I said, it wouldn't be long before it all started to catch up with him.
Now, at this point, Doug has done blew up. There's been a lot of activity in the streets from his gangs and their ops. He even ran into some legal problems of his own. But coming from the trenches of Detroit, with all of the history we've covered, it shouldn't be surprising that it didn't take long for these age-old street beefs between the 42 Hustle Boys and the SMB to start showing its face in the industry. Another rapper from Detroit, who is a 7 Mile Blood member named Sada Baby, also started to take off musically around the same time as Doug. Of course, with Sada being from SMB and Doug being from the 42 Hustle Boys, it was up from the beginning with these two, just off the strength of the gang ties. Unlike 42 Doug though, Sada Baby says he didn't start gang banging until the age of 23, even though he started rapping at 19. And, and you have blood lyrics throughout your... Uh... Cause I'm a blood. Now, is there a lot of Bloods and Crips in Detroit? Yeah. Okay. What age you uh, start to join that? Like 22, 23, something like that. So later on? Yeah, I always grew up in the neighborhood. I grew up in the neighborhood of, of the Bloods, but... You know, I'll be honest. I haven't heard of people joining that late in age very mm -hmm. often. Everyone, you know, and I interview a lot of gangsters, a lot of bloods. Yeah, that's because a lot of niggas just be gang banging their whole life. I was playing basketball, doing kid shit. So he's been rapping longer than he's been gang banging. But don't let that fool you because Sada Baby still grew up in the blood infested neighborhoods of Detroit. Sada caught a lot of backlash because of how late he joined the gang. Because most gang members joined in their early teens and he made the decision as a grown ass man to join a gang. He said the decision to join came after rap was failing to produce any money and he had to move back in with his grandma and get a real job. He said that wasn't for him, so he turned to the streets. Sada Baby also has a cousin in the rap game named Icewear Vezo, and Icewear Vezo is a crip. But Sada explained in an interview that the two had too much respect for each other to beef over some gang affiliations. Regardless, Sada Baby is still a blood and also is one of the most popular rappers coming out of Detroit. Even though he wasn't put down until the age of 23, he still reps his set to the fullest. And since initiation into the gang, Sada has inherited the age old beefs that came with it. Now, the beat between the 42 Hustle Boys and the 7 Mile Bloods had died down in the streets and there was a few years without any bodies getting dropped, but this would all change when another popular rapper inadvertently got involved, T Grizzly. The rapper that took Doug to LA the week he met Lil Baby for the first time and T Grizzly comes from Joy Road in Detroit. T has never publicly claimed any affiliation to any gang, but was raised in the west side of Detroit with his grandmother because in 2011, his mom was sentenced to 20 years in prison for drug trafficking and his pops got killed the very next year in 2012. T had it hard growing up, but it looked like he was on the path to get out when he got accepted into Michigan State University to play ball and study finance. But like with most people from the streets of Detroit, he found it hard to stay out of trouble. While living as a broke college student, T started robbing the other dorms for cash and electronics. He was caught, but released while the university conducted an investigation. During this time, T and his homies pulled a Houdini and disappeared. Turns out, they had headed to Lexington, Kentucky, where they ended up robbing a jewelry store. The robbery was a failure, and T and his three accomplices were arrested. T was sentenced to nine months for the robbery, and while already serving that sentence, he was sentenced to another 18 months to 15 years for the Michigan State robberies. T was released from prison on October 6, 2016, and shortly after, he dropped his first song titled First Day Out, and it took off and blew up. Today, this song currently sits at a cool 227 million views on YouTube. T Grizzly has since been able to solidify his presence as a leading artist coming out of Detroit. Just because Grizzly isn't affiliated with the gang doesn't mean he can't get wrapped up in some gang activity. And Grizzly would accidentally reignite this age old beef between the Hustle Boys and SMB. Early in T Grizzly's career, he collaborated with one of the 4 2 twins on a song titled Secrecy. This wasn't a problem. The problem came when shortly after this record was released, T signed Sada Baby to his record label. 4 2 twin hopped online and clearly wasn't amused by the whole thing. So I'm just keep this 100, dog. When you fing with a nigga, bro, it don't matter what level you on. Or none of that shit. This shit not about no rap or no fame, bro. This shit be real, bro. Like, nigga, I got nigga then died, brother in prison, in prison, bro. Then died over this, shit, bro. This is real street, shit, bro. Then died, bro. You can't play a nigga like me close and then go running with my op. 
nigga and befriending my ops and think that's supposed to be cool with me. It's blood on this shit, bro. You reached out to me. I never reached out to you, bro. 42 Twin then responded by posting a picture on Instagram where he tagged T Grizzly and he said, don't get your car flipped leaving off that block. T responded directly in the comments of this post saying, you reached out to me for a feature. Don't none of your homies fuck with you because you ain't real. Don't act like this about Sada. 42 Twin responded saying, we can end this. You DM'd me. I didn't even know you. I'm with my homies every day. So with all this, T found himself front and center of the beef. Hey man, what, like what do y'all be wanting, bro? Like it gotta be something else, bro. It have to be, cause I get money. I pull up on this so love. I share the little the little wave I got. I share that. With you know what I'm saying? Do everything I can for it, and that still ain't enough. Like still be mad, still bad, motherfucker, and still do it. Like it gotta be something else y'all want. What y'all want? Y'all want me to step outside my body and let y'all step in so you can beat me or something? Bro? I can't do that, bro. God ain't make like that. And even if he did, I'm so much of a good. I, I probably would let that be and see how this feel. But now I can't. I can see so love, do all types of and still hate. Like, what the fuck do y'all want, bro? It gotta be something else, bro. It gotta be, bro. Now. Here's where things might get a little confusing because after that exchange, T went on to do a collab track with 42 Doug called MWBL in 2019. This led people to believe that this meant the beef couldn't be that serious, but if you thought that, you was wrong. Because in August of 2019, T was in a black Chrysler in East Detroit when somebody rolled through and sprayed the car up. During the incident, T Grizzly's aunt and manager named JB was hit and died as a result. Sada Baby was also managed by JB and can be seen attending her funeral in T Grizzly's saddest music video where T talks about the incident. Sada Baby also is the person who had to identify the body as T Grizzly was in the hospital. We're not going to talk about the T Grizzly situation. His aunt was actually your manager at one point. That's my baby. How did you feel when she got killed? Same way I feel now. It's past sad. I had to um, identify a body. What was that like to have to look and identify the body of someone that you seem like to have a lot of love for? Um, like a movie. They sit you down, give you the talk, and you just hoping they, they, they beating around the bush to tell you that, well, she gonna have to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life, or she gonna, you feel me, some like that. But like it was fucked up, cause she looked like her face, her face and that shit wasn't fucked up, so. Shortly after JB was murdered, Sada Baby left T Grizzly's label, claiming he wasn't being managed properly anymore. Plus, the fact that he dropped that song with 42 Doug, when 42 Doug is an op of SMB, probably played a part in that. The beef between Sada and Doug, 42 and SMB, heated up one night when both rappers were in the same club together. The 42 gang was on stage and performed a song that was a diss to the Seven Mile Bloods while Sada Baby was in the crowd. After that, there was an alleged incident at a recording studio where Sada got robbed and the streets say Doug was behind it. Sada was on Instagram live session when he would announce to the world that he wasn't rocking with another rapper named Doughboy who's from Cleveland, Ohio. Doughboy fired back on Instagram claiming that Sada was a fake blood and then makes reference to the robbery. This is how the world became aware of the allegation that Sada got robbed. Sada responded with this post where he said if you let fans provoke you into speaking about stuff you should have been left alone then you a goofy. Doughboy responded by telling the embarrassing story about how Sada got robbed and alleges that Sada got stripped naked and robbed with his own gun. They took everything, money, clothes, jewelry, guns, all of it. Apparently Sada and Doughboy were at the same place when it happened and Sada ran into the other room where Doughboy was at and started freaking out about what happened and Doughboy says he had to pull a strap on Sada just to make him calm down. After this, 42 Doug went live and clown Sada for getting robbed and even took credit for being the one who stuck him up. Sada denies the allegation, but it's up to y'all to decide who you believe in this incident since there's no evidence one way or another. Since then, both artists have taken shots at each other on social media and in interviews. But what seemed to be randomly, both artists appeared on a song titled Friday Night Cypher by Big Sean. 
In an interview, Sada seemed to suggest that he didn't even know Doug was going to be on the song and basically says Doug's verse was trash and also threw shade at T Grizzly saying he only got on the track to prove he was the better rapper. Then, Sada Baby can be seen shutting down a club performance after the DJ played a T Grizzly and then a 42 Doug track back to back. He also called T Grizzly a disloyal fake gangster who hides in Detroit. Doug responded to all the beef by posting a video saying he was smoking on Heli Blood today disrespecting Sada's dead homies. Hey 420 man we blowing healthy blood. We blowing healthy bloods today. Not long after, 42 Doug seemed to be the target of another shooting at a music video for a collab song he did with Roddy Rich. Neither rapper was shot, although two people were, but they survived the incident. People thought this was Sada Baby, but in a twist of fate, another rapper from Mobile, Alabama named OMB Peasy was arrested in connection with the shooting. Peasy had maintained his innocence and says he didn't do nothing, although he was there, and the speculation is that Peasy might have just been shooting back at the original shooter in self-defense and just don't want to say that. Either way, he was arrested in connection to it and held on a $60,000 bond, which he posted. PZ has stated that he don't have beef with Sada or Doug, so it would seem like this isn't the actual culprit, leaving it up in the air about who it actually was. Either way, the beef in the streets of Detroit didn't seem to be dying down anytime soon. Although, Doug probably won't be involved in anything for the foreseeable future because for him, it would all come crashing down in a dramatic series of events. Now, last time we checked on Doug, he was at the height of his career, getting features from everybody that matters, and things were going well. This was until he was arrested after assaulting a police officer and fleeing. It took them two months to catch him. He was released and in order to wear an ankle monitor. Now, I didn't give you guys the conclusion because I was saving it for this part of the video. After being released on that $20,000 bond and wearing a new ankle bracelet, Doug released his first song titled Free Me, where he basically pleaded his case on record and begged the court to release him from house arrest. He was eventually released from house arrest, but he was still on probation, and if you remember, I told you guys he had failed multiple drug tests for opioids. Well, because of this, he was sentenced to six months in a federal prison camp. They gave him a delayed start and told him he wouldn't have to start his sentence until April 12, 2022, but when the day came for him to report, Doug was nowhere to be found. For the next three months, after not reporting for his prison sentence, Doug continued to evade the police, but he was dropping of music and even made appearances on social media while he was on the run. The feds noticed the online activity and were looking to arrest Doug for not reporting to prison, so they took the opportunity to ping his phone, finding that he was in Memphis. In fact, Doug was sitting courtside at a Memphis Grizzly game, which was airing on live TV. The feds tried to pin Doug down by checking flight records and manifests, but Doug's name wasn't on any of them, commercial or private. Using geolocation, the feds were able to narrow it down to one plane in particular that Doug was on once he left Memphis. Once they knew which flight it was, they waited at the airport for it to land. Once the private jet landed, they detained Doug and tried to confiscate the phone he had, but the pilot of the plane swiped the phone and tried to make a getaway, but was caught only minutes later. Doug was arrested on May the 6th, 2022. Apparently, his security had two Glocks with extended magazines and high capacity ammunition on them. What's crazy is that Doug somehow managed to have a private jet with no tail number with him not on the manifest and a pilot that was willing to let it all happen. The feds say there is no way this is happenstance and that Doug was intentionally invading the police. Doug was charged with escape in addition to a six month prison sentence he originally had. Plus, with it being a federal case and it's an escape charge, these two charges will have consecutive sentence. It's an escape charge because the government looks at not showing up for prison as the same as leaving prison when you're not supposed to. Which means he'll have to do the six months he is already scheduled to do, then do whatever time he is given for the escape charge, which could be up to five years. All of that time just because he didn't want to do six months. Doug has had a wild story and only time will tell if he has left a big enough mark to be released from prison and have a comeback in music but one thing is for sure there is a lasting story behind Doug and if he gets out moves the right way he might be able to pick up right where he left off anyways that's it for the video guys if you enjoyed the content be sure to hit the like button subscribe hit the notification bell if you want to be notified every time I upload a video drop me a comment let me know what y'all thought about the video man I work real hard on these 
these they take a long time a lot of research so i appreciate all the love all the support we just passed 5,000 subscribers which to me is crazy because we just started six months ago anyways man thank y'all and as always it's been fun rocking with y'all man i'm out